All right. I'd like to thank Ezra and Michelle for the opportunity, and uh, thank you for all of you for getting up and coming to listen to us. We're going to shift gears a little bit. So I'm going to mention pegs in this talk, but we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on that. It's a little bit different. I don't have any disclosures for this. Um, so esophageal cancer, we know the incidence of esophageal cancer has been increasing over the last 30 to 40 years at a really remarkable rate, and it remains a very deadly cancer. And approximately 50% of patients who get referred are going to have unresectable disease at the time of presentation. Now, in a surgery office, it's a little bit different. Most of the patients are there to talk about surgery. But when we looked into our own institutional experience, patients who present with dysphagia and have evidence of at least a partially obstructing mass on endoscopy need chemoradiation about 98% of the time. So we know nutritional management in these patients is really important. So that's what we're going to talk about for the next 10 minutes or so. Um, just quickly to mention, palliation. So sometimes patients do get referred straight from a gastroenterologist or, um, and come in and you find they have metastatic disease, they have dysphagia, they, they're not eating well, their quality of life uh, is bad. And we know in these patients the primary goal is to figure out how do we maximize the quality of the time uh, for the patient. So your options are really going to be the same as they are for anybody else. Dilations in the absence of stenting are pretty short term. A solution in these patients, but stents can be a good option for patients who tolerate them. Palliative radiation is possible. Uh, when patients ask about uh, tube feedings for nutritional support, it's possible and you can do it. It's well, something that you probably want to do in context of conversations with palliative care teams because we want to make sure that they have well-developed goals of care for the patient and then try to do something that fits in well within those goals in the context of their uh, overall illness. So I'm going to move on from that and we can talk about how do we manage patients who come in with dysphagia in the, who are planning to proceed with neoadjuvant therapy followed by a resection. So first, let me start by talking to the patient, because there's a lot of variation in how the patients present, how they're doing. Can they tolerate liquids? Can they get uh, high-calorie liquids down? Now, especially, you know, clear uh, supplements and things, there's a lot of uh, high-calorie liquids that people can take. Are they losing weight? Are they malnourished? And what do you think their overall fitness for surgery is. People who are very fit can tolerate a lot while you're trying to get them through the first phase of treatment. People who are really borderline candidates for surgery, sometimes I'm a little more aggressive with them about trying to get early nutrition access for them to try to not lose too much ground while we're going through that first uh, steps. So again, you want to know your options, oral feeding, whether they're liquids, solids, whatever patients can eat, dietary consultation, dilation and stenting, again, can work. We're going to talk about that, and then feeding tubes. So isn't, if somebody comes in, they've lost some weight, they have dysphagia, they're struggling to eat, is an intervention early required? And the answer is usually not. And this is a nice study from the McGill group where they looked at, do we need to, to access those patients' GI tracts? So they had 78 of 130 patients they looked at presented with se severe dysphagia at the time of presentation prior to treatment. 75 of the 78 had improvement in dysphagia scores and improvement in quality of life just with uh, chemo radiation. So if you can get them through the first start of the of the radiation treatments, swallowing starts to get better. People can start to eat, and they do just fine. In this study, patients were able to maintain their BMI. The serum albumins remained stable, and only one patient out of this group required any intervention. So this is pretty very much in line, I think, with what we see in our own practice, where we try to get people through without uh, procedures to have to. Um, intervene in the GI tract. So patients who come in and they have severe dysphagia, they really can't eat, they're dropping weight, they're not getting anything down. I think stents can be good for that because they're temporizing. If the patients tolerate it, they can eat, take, start taking liquids fairly quickly and it kind of gets them to the place where we were talking about most patients start is what essentially happens. It's really important to use fully covered stents. I have seen patients get partially covered stents placed 
go for chemotherapy and radiation, and it can be hard to get the stents out. I've actually seen two patients in my career come in with eroded stents and aortoesophageal fistulas from radiating the exposed teeth of those uh, uh, partially covered stents. So that's just something to be aware of and uh, avoid. Uh, the pros. They're fairly easy to place in most circumstances. And they, the advantage that a stent will have over any feeding tube is that you actually restore you know, the patient's ability to eat and take food by mouth. So it has some positive quality of life benefits when you're dealing with an overall process that we know has a significant negative impact on people's quality of life. And then the cons, though, can people can have a lot of pain from the stent. Sometimes the cure is worse than the problem. Um, migration rates are high, especially during the course of, uh, of uh, chemo radiation. And then sometimes when we go to surgery, we see a lot of scarring around the esophagus, a lot of inflammation from around the stent can make the operation a little more difficult than it would have been uh, otherwise. So I always take the stents out early. So we're, they're finishing their chemotherapy and radiation and try to get the stent out uh, before we start talking about going in for surgery. The jejunostomy. So sort of the conventional wisdom around esophagectomy says if you have a malnourished patient, you need to give them tube feeds. We're going to use the stomach for reconstruction. You should place a feeding jejunostomy. And so the reasons for that, you avoid any manipulation of the stomach prior to surgery. And a lot of people probably say, well, we're going to have to put a J-tube in at the time of surgery anyway, so why not put one in now? Uh, we're going to maybe challenge that uh, assumption a little bit in a minute. The cons, I think J-tubes in general are just more difficult to manage. The patients have to be fed on a pump. You're not allowing them the ability to eat. It doesn't have that uh, pos uh, quality of life benefit. And then J-tubes are as associated with uh, an awful lot of difficult complications, bowel obstructions. The tubes themselves are also difficult. And there are a lot of some reports about patients having problems that actually prevent them from completing chemo radiation and things from J2 complications. So that's a problem that you want to avoid. Um, and this, again, just about uh, complications and how much you see that. And the fact that with J2, so we talked about PEGs, have a high rate of complications, but they tend to be fairly minor as long as the placement goes okay. In J tubes, about half of the complications you see with J tubes are actually major complications. Uh, gastrostomy tubes. So the pros to saying, well, maybe we can put in a lab G tube or a peg. Easier to do, easier to manage the tubes, and probably a lower rate of at least major complications that are likely to derail your therapy. The cons to this, the biggest one, right, is potential injury to the right gastroplaque arcade. It would have to be a pretty good shot. Like your gastroenterologist would almost have to be William Tell to hit it, but. The, uh, I have seen a couple patients where I went to do esophagectomies where a peg had been placed and it's going right through the uh, fat pad that runs with the right gastroplug artery makes the gastrotomies difficult to close. And so you have to be careful and then make sure whoever's placing that peg knows how to identify the anterior wall of the stomach and try to get that tube away from the greater curvature of the stomach. All right, so do I need a J-tube after an esophagectomy? So we're gonna do the resection, do our gastric pull-up. Do we need to place feeding tubes? So maybe we do. There's a study from recently looking at SEER Medicare data that actually suggests that um, patients who had feeding J-tubes and had j genostomy tubes placed, like God tube feeds, had uh, lower mortality rates after surgery. Now, it's a little bit hard to know how to interpret that because selection bias around tubes and things like that, but um, the data's there. Maybe not, though, because here's a study with, that looked at the same thing in the Swedish national database and a good number of patients that showed no real difference in patient quality of life or, over, or survival after after surgery, and there were about half of their patients had feeding J's, half of them didn't. Now, none of these studies are randomized. Our own experience at Ohio State, I had stopped putting J tubes in our esophagectomy patients about three and a half years ago. Um, I have not regretted it, and I, I sort of need to look at that and write it up and take a little deeper dive into 
into how the patients are doing. I haven't actually thought uh, that I've seen any differences in eating and things like that. I do know that I haven't had a single J-tube-related complication since I stopped putting them in. Uh, so the current approach that we use at Ohio State, when at all possible, we try to we have nutritional consults. We have dietitians who work very closely with our patients, talk them through, get them through the first part of their treatment, and try to avoid uh, any interventions at all other than that. Um, when somebody really has significant weight loss, malnutrition, or they're borderline candidates uh, for surgery, I do tend to start with stents. If they tolerate them, we can get them through with a stent. Uh, I think it's kind of either 50-50. If people you want to do stent, you want to do feeding tube. Our preferred method anymore is generally to do a G-tube, so either a lap G-tube or a PEG, uh, just because we think that they are easier for the patient, bolus feedings. And then I do a ischemic conditioning as part of our esophagectomy program, so we're doing staging laparoscopies two weeks prior to surgery. So I kind of circumvent the problem of having this gastrotomy that you have to close and then pull up into the chest and worry about it leaking because I take the feeding tube out at the time of that operation, close the gastrotomy during the two-week conditioning interval that heals by the time we come back and do the resection. That's all healed, so that's one thing you have to worry about that we kind of don't. In J-tubes, I really reserve placing them for patients who, frail patients who I think are really marginal surgical candidates that we're going to operate on anyway, who are likely to need that feeding tube after surgery, I will just put it in uh, on the front end. Thank you.